Let's remain standing just a moment for prayer while we bow our heads. Most gracious and holy Father, as we approach thy divine throne of grace, we stand in the shadows of thy justice. We would ask, Lord, that by your grace that you would forgive us of our sins and trespasses. We desire mercy. Do not judge us according to our lives and our works. Do not give us justice, but give us mercy. Father, we pray that you will make this uh, an afternoon that will long be remembered because of your presence. Thanking you for what you've done this morning around over the city and throughout the valley and over the world. Pray, God, that you'll continue to be with us and giving us our grace and mercy until Jesus comes. Bless the words that shall be read and the, the comments that will be passed upon the word. Let thy spirit be in all that we do or say. Heal the sick and the afflicted. And we would not forget, Lord, the convalescent, those who cannot come. We pray that the Holy Spirit will stand by their bed this afternoon while many here in the building are packing burdens for them. May they be healed. Life is over and we stand in thy presence. We will bow humbly to thank thee and give thee all the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. It is such a delight to come and speak to an audience in the name of the Lord Jesus, having this assurance that he, he will never leave us nor forsake us. He'll be with us in every trial that we have. And just the humble faith to believe him, accept him as our Savior, and believe on him for all that we have need of in life. I know it's awfully hot this afternoon. But you'd be surprised how much difference it is here than it is in the Belgium Congo, where they would come and down in South Africa. They would come of a morning, and they would lay on the ground all day long in that hot, blistering sun. Not for just a day, but wait there for two or three weeks for me to get to the nation. Come down through the jungles, packing their loved ones on boards and things. The lion would come, and they'd push them up the tree and wait maybe a day or so till the lion left. And come on down, maybe go a little farther, try to get a drink out of a water flowing, the crocodile to get one of the children. They keep moving on. See, they weep for a few hours, noise over and go on. That's the people. They don't mind the heat. They're trying to find life. See, they're trying to find something that gives peace and that passes understanding. And this afternoon, let's keep that such a, a loyalty on our mind as we set this afternoon. I know it's hot, but we can't govern the weather. We've got to have hot weather to bring forth the fruit and so forth. God knows how to temper his earth to, to bring forth the abundance for us to live on. And if we had all rain and shadows and so forth, we would starve. So we're very thankful to be here. And I see the people has the fans in your hand. Now, if you've just got the electricity, why, well, it'll be all right. Then it'll help cool a little bit. Now, let us approach the word by St. John, the 14th chapter. Beginning tomorrow night, the Lord willing, I wish to speak a series of subjects, building faith, if I can. God will help me. I want to try to build faith for our oncoming services this next week. Try to, if you can. I know many of you work and it's hard to get out. I don't, don't have to want to say this. For you to come, just many times those expressions are made. I hope not. I've never been here. Many times people want large crowds out to get certain offerings. Many times they want large crowds out for the psychological effect it has on the people. That can, many people say, well, I don't want to preach unless there's a big crowd. I preach to big crowds and little crowds. It makes no difference what it is. I just held a revival in a church that held 20. So it was pitiful, down zero weather and is standing outside. But I don't need money. We just have to pay the expenses. That's all you're asked to do. I, I wish I could pay them myself. I wouldn't ask for that. And I, I never took an offering in my life. 
I remember one time that I was got in a hard place. How many knows what that means? <laughs> My wife sitting here this afternoon. She usually gets a kind of little shy look at me when I say this, but I just come in from. I was working. I pastored at the Tabernacle of Jeffersonville for 17 years and never had one cent of a salary. Besides, I put what money I could spare into the offerings and always paid my tithes and so forth. But I come in and we just didn't have enough money to make the thing go. And I said to her, I said, "You know what, honey? I'm going to take up an offering tonight." She said, "I want to be sure to go over and see you do that." And so she sat back. Now the people would give it. It was time of the war and so forth, and or just before the war. And、um, so she she knew that they would give it. They They'd lounge their children at the table to help me, but I I, I realize that and I never want to take advantage of anything like that. So I was young, working. I was where I could work, and I had a patrol job, walking thirty some odd miles a day through the wilderness and so forth. Very hard, making forty five cents an hour. But then I I went over to take up the offering, and I never forget it. An old friend of mine, I said, "Friends, I'm a little in need tonight." I said. I need about five dollars. I said I got a bill that's coming due. I just can't make it. I said I got other things. I said we didn't have a collection plate in the church. I said if somebody will get my hat there, we'll just take up an offering. Got a nickel or something together. There's an audience practically size on this floor of my church. And I said uh, uh, Mr. Wisehart went over to get my hat, and I looked at a little old woman, the sweetest little old thing, one of those old-fashioned mothers that used to wear these little old spotted aprons. And had the pocket on the inside, you know, of the apron. Did you ever see one of those? My old grandmother, she used to wear one of those, and she smoked a cane pipe. She didn't want the man to see her smoking, so she carried her tobacco in that pocket. And she'd see some of the man coming, she'd just stick her hand under that apron and hold her thumb on that pipe and talk to him. And as they left, she'd come across the floor that old cane pipe. I remember before she died, she was 110 years old. She remembered the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Never saw but one car in her life. I brought that down there, way back in the mountain country. Never seen a train in her all of her life. But I held her in my arms and prayed for her. She probably weighed fifty pounds, just dried up. And so she was the sweetest of little things. She got saved, and she put her arms around my neck. And the last thing she said, "God bless your little heart now and forevermore." And she went to be with the Lord. And as my father's mother, and I remember this little woman. She kept her. Her little ape had her little apron. She'd wear to church. She didn't live but a little ways, and we were all poor. And she reached down in the pocket, this little old pocket, and brought out one of the little pocket books of snaps on top. You know, reaching down there for those nickels. Oh my! I'd have tucked that. I felt like Judas. <laughs> I tucked that money <laughs> and thirty pieces of silver. And I see her reach. I looked at that. I great big lump coming. You know, had a feeling in your throat like a lump. I said, "Oh, I was just teasing you. I didn't mean that." I said, "I always want to see what you say." Here the deacon was in the church with the、uh, hat in his hand. He looked at me and said, "What must I do?" I said, "Just hang my hat up." Well, I was just going on. See, I know she'd put that nickel or dime in there. I couldn't spend it. So I never will forget, honey. She knows about it. I said, I went over and I had an old bicycle, brother John Ryan. He was really a, kind of like a house of David, long hair. He. Wrote it down there, and he gave it to me. It wasn't it wasn't backslid; it just wore out. That was all. So I went out to the ten cent store and got a can of paint and painted it and set it out front and sold it for five dollars. I didn't have to take up the offering, so that's the closest I ever come of taking an offering. So we are not here for that purpose. We are here to try to help you, to try to do something to make. To make it、uh, the neighborhood here a little easier to do right, a little harder to do wrong, make life a little pleasanter to you. Maybe the God will heal your sickness and lengthen your days, save the lost, help the churches. These are my sponsors. They are man who believes the same thing I believe. They wouldn't be setting up here if they didn't believe it. And they're to me the cream of the crop. Now I mean that not to be some of them there with gray hair older than I was out here preaching on the corner with a. A guitar and a tambourine. When I was just a sinful boy, so I feel little to stand out in front of these men this afternoon. They should be here. They made the road easy for me to travel over. Preaching these things would come, and here they are coming. So one plants, another waters. God gets the increase. That's the way it'll be.、And、on that great morning over there, when the table set across the canopies of the skies, 
when all life is over, we sit down at that wedding supper. I want to be there so bad, brother. Oh, I want to be there. I, I believe I will. I live right and try hard. God will let me come there. Not by what I do, but by His grace. I'll reach across the table and shake hands with some of y'all. I say, I remember you. You're at Yakima, see, on earth. No doubt a little tear run down our cheeks for joy. Then the great thing, to see the king come out, all of his beauty, and wipe the tears from her eyes. Say, don't cry, children. It's all over now. Enter into the joys of the Lord. It's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. That's what I want to hear. And we'll be changed in this creature that we are, be immortal, made like unto his own glorious body. And the toils of the hot days and the fanning and so forth will all be over then. We'll enter into the peace of the Lord forever. Till that time, let's labor, work, and pray, watching for the coming of the Lord. St. John, the 14th chapter, and let's begin at the 7th verse and read the 12th verse inclusive. Jesus speaking. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And my subject for the afternoon is, show us the Father, and it will satisfy. Suffice us means to satisfy. If you'll show us the Father, it'll satisfy us. Now I'm going to take on this, it's been the desire of the human heart since there's ever been a human. They want to know where is God, if I could only see God. And I'm going to speak of four different ways of seeing God. And last night I took the subject of Sir, and 12th chapter of St. John, Sirs, we would see Jesus. And I believe all that was here last night in their right mind, knowing anything about the scripture, saw him working among the people. If it didn't, I believe you're almost past hopes. See, if you, if you didn't sit at the scripture, lay just solidly all the way from Genesis on down through the scripture, exactly what he promised here in the last days. And here we seen him come into the building last night for the Christian looks at the unseen. Do you know that? The whole Christian armor is unseen. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, patience. All the fruits of the Spirit is unseen. People say, I'm from Missouri. Seeing is believing. Then you can never be a Christian. Because you've got to accept God by faith. See, you've got to believe Him. And last evening when we seen Him come in by the Spirit, move along and confirm in His people, the believers in the building, put along. And seen him do just exactly what he did when he was here on earth, confirming this scripture, the works that I do, shall you also. And seeing the same results by human beings so submitted to God until the Holy Spirit can work through those human beings, just like the Holy Spirit worked through Jesus, who just has confessed that I and my Father are one. My Father dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. It's not my words, it's his words. Thing. He was so submitted to God, and he died and sanctified a church that he might live in to continue his works until the second advent of his, uh, his coming. He comes the second time. Now, we're going to see if we can see God. How many would like to see God? Let's see your hands. I, I know it's juvenile-like, but we're supposed to be children. 
When we get to know a whole lot, then we don't know nothing that we ought to know, the Bible said. We always never want to get a great intellectual feeling that we're above somebody or no more than somebody else. Just be common and simple. People will try to explain God and go come over the top of it. People look for God way out there when he's standing right here, see. That's, you just, you, the simplicity of it con- just confuses the great, powerful, intellectual mind that tries to make him some great something that he's not. He's here with us. He's God. Just a, he, he's part of you. He's a fiber of you. We're the flesh of his flesh and the bone of his bone. We are part of him because we're his children. And God dwells in us just like he did in his son, Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to look at God in four ways. Now, three is a confirmation, but we're going to throw one extra in this afternoon to make it positive. Anyone knows that, that two is a witness. Three is a confirmation. Uh, The Jew said to Jesus, we know that you're a a demon because you speak of yourself. It takes two to make a witness. Jesus said, I'm one and the father that dwelleth in me is the other one. (laughs) If you can't believe me, believe the works that he's doing in me, you see. So that made a confirmation of two. But now three, and now we're going to take four ways of seeing God. First, God in his universe. God in his word. God in his son. God in his people. God in his universe, we'll see if we find him in the universe. God in his word, we'll see if we can find him in the word. God in his son, we'll see if he's in his son. Then God in his people and see if he's in his people. That's four ways that we can see God. The infidel said, let me see him. Some time ago, I was speaking on a corner. There was an infidel which was speaking on the next corner. And he was, had the Bible in there, said it's the dirtiest, honorous book ever written. And all he was just going on was, had been a priest, or studied to be a priest in a monastery. And very much of a theologian, know the word. And so he was chewing tobacco. And he, I was standing by a little grocery store. And when he come in to get groceries, then here the preacher and infidel met together. So he said, uh, oh, you're that preacher who's doing a lot of hollering down here. I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, um... You don't believe that stuff you're saying. I said, with all of my heart, I believe it. And I know he was smart to be in a monastery, you see. So I said, yes, sir, I, I believe with all my heart. So I know his wits was too much for me to match, but I know I had a God that could match anything that the devil could put out. So I just held on to see what God had seen. He said, if I'll prove to you there's not one thing in what you're talking about, will you accept it? I said, I don't believe you can do it. He said, there is no such a thing as God. I said, that's your opinion. My opinion's different. And he said, well, look, how many senses does the human body have? And I said, uh, well, they got senses. How far did you go to school? I said, it's far enough to know there's a God. And, and he said, uh, "He said, well, uh, name the human senses. And I said, see, taste, feel, smell in here. He said, now, if he's a human God to the human, surely one of those senses would declare him. He said, now, did you ever see him? Did you ever taste him? Smell him, feel him, or hear him. I said, I felt him. I feel him now. He said, let me feel him. That sense of feeling goes the same way, see, with your fingers. And, um, and I said, well, it's possible that I could feel him and you could not feel him. He said, oh, no, no. You can't pull your psychology on me. And I took a pen and stuck him. <laughs> and he said, um, I thought he was going to slap me first. But I stepped back a few out of his reach. And... Um, I said, I did that for a purpose, sir. Excuse me. But I just want to make a point. I said, did you feel that? <laughs> he said, I certainly did. And I said, but I didn't feel it. He said, let me stick you. And I said, yeah, you believe the same thing I believe and you have the same results. So, that's right. It's possible you could have a cramp in your stomach and I know nothing about it. But it's real to you, you see. But it wouldn't be to me unless I had the same cramp in my stomach or headache or whatever it might be. So then... I said, well, and I was thinking, and he was, you know, you have to, the mother used to say, if you give the cow enough rope, she'll hang herself. So that's why you, I, I played right up to his psychology. And I said, you know what? You are a very smart man. He said, my mother never raised any fools. And I said, well, that's a good thing. I said, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't know. I couldn't say because the Bible said the fool said in his heart there's no God, you know, but I, I couldn't say that right then because I was playing him right up to the spot where I want him. And I said, you have one of the most brilliant mind I ever seen, uh, ever uh, talked to, a man that had a brilliant mind like you. He said, that's right. Oh, he was blowed up. That's where I know I had to play on him on right there. And I said, you'll admit you got a mind? <laughs> and he said, well, sure. 
Why? You act like you've lost yours. And I said, no, I don't think I have. But I said, I just wonder if you really got a mind. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, it's a human mind, isn't it? He caught right then what I was going to do. He said, I, I said, no, sir, I was a gentleman. I answered your, I said, name the senses of the body. Well, he said, you know them. I said, I want you to say them. <laughs> I said, I said them for you when I told you I knew them. He said, see, taste, feel, smell, and hear it. I said, you ever see your mind? <laughs> you ever smell it, taste it, hear it? No. I said, then you haven't got a mind. <laughs> He said, oh, I know I got a mind. I said, I know I got a God too, sir. <laughs> I just know that. So all the armor of God is unseen. But it's the unseen that the Christian looks at. Like Abraham called things which was not as though they were because God had said so. So we're going to look not, not to the unseen this afternoon, but four ways that we're going. We could take a dozen, but we're just going to take those four ways for a uh, a confirmation that God lives right now. God is right here this afternoon, right here in this room. He promised wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. Now, we're going to speak first on God in his universe. Now, how could the world hold up in the space that it's in? After all, which is top or bottom of it? Who knows? The ones that's down at the north, at the south pole, feel just as much like they're on top as one at the north pole. So you see, it's just, they push this way, which is pushing down. We think we're, they're pointing up. See, they think they're pointing up, but they're pointing down to us. And we're pointing up, but we're pointing down to them. So it's hanging in air. What holds it there? Throw a ball in there and spin it as fast as you wish to. This world's turning a little better than 1,000 miles an hour. 25,000 miles around it turns around, makes a complete revolution every 24 hours. But so it makes it a little better than 1,000 miles an hour it's turning. Well, you spin a ball into the air at equally the same speed. See, it wouldn't make one round in the same cycle. It would fall. It'd either be going up, going down, going sideways or something. What holds it there? We know it's been here for 6,000 years. We have record of it. That is standing here in the same spot and they can time it with the moon and stars so perfectly till it won't miss a second. They can predict it 20 years ahead when the eclipse of the sun will be, when the moon and sun passes. Everything works in harmony to God, all of God's creation, but man. So man is his son and feels that he knows just a little bit more than father does. So we try to figure it all out instead of just believing what he said about it. That's all. Some time ago, an infidel said to me, talking about all the moon and the sun and how it flickered a little piece off. I said, how are you going to prove that? And I said, the only thing you can do is prove it by faith. And I said, I want to tell you now, my faith's too weak for that. I just believe what the Bible said. That's the only thing I got faith in is what God said. He made the heavens and earth, and I just believe it that way. So that's the faith that I have is what God said about it. And now, then how could it ever be? How could that little flower live this afternoon, that vine? How could it live, plant rather, without God? All the scientists in the world couldn't make one of those leaves on there. They can make something that looks like it, but they couldn't make that leaf because that leaf has got life in it, and science can never produce life. A little flower. You take like you women here. It gets cold here in the valley. I go around and see your flower gardens now. I was riding around a while ago trying to keep my mind on God and praying, Lord, do something here in the valley. Please help your people. It's such a dark hour. And riding up and down the roads uh, uh, praying. And then I pass by and see the lovely flowers. Now, it won't be long till frost to hit that little flower. It'll bow its little head to death. Some of them will be young, middle-aged, and old. Out of there drops a little black seed. Whether you believe it or not, God has a funeral procession for his flowers. Did you know that? Sure does. The fall rains comes and cries great big tears down out of the skies and buries that little black seed under the ground. That's exactly right. Long comes the winter and freezes the seed. Burst is open. The pulp runs out. And now it freezes several inches deep. The stalk's gone. The bulb's gone. The petal's gone. The seed's gone. The pulp's gone. Is that the end of that flower? No, sir. Just as soon as the, the sun rises and the east begins to warm. Now, you can't take a, a light and put on it and do it. It takes the sunlight light. Put the sunlight on it and begin to warm it. It'll come back to life again. God had that little germ of life hid somewhere so he could live again because it's in God's will. It's God's plan. God put it here for a purpose and it doesn't fuss or stew. It just serves the purpose that God put it here for. And if we'll just do the same, serve the purpose that God put us here for. 
Not to just to be, we got to raise hogs and that's all right. We got to do this other. But he put us here to be sons and daughters of God, to glorify him and to praise him. Like the little flower. Preached on the subject not long ago. Behold the lilies. And I took the lily, Pastor Lily. How he opens up his heart. The bee takes his part out. And every, the tourists pass by. That beautiful smell. Everything gets a part of Mr. Lily and he has to toil day and night to produce that. Don't you believe God is in his universe? Everywhere God is. Up at my home, I live on the Ohio River. And oh, I just love water. And there was a little boy that lived down in the city and he went to a church and he's a fine little lad. And he said to his mother one day, he said, mother, I want to ask you a question. He said, I hear the preacher talk about God being so great and said, now, I just wonder if anybody could ever see God. Why? She said, honey, you asked your Sunday school teacher. I said, mother couldn't answer that. I don't know nothing about it. And so they asked the Sunday school teacher and she said, oh, I wouldn't know about that. You ought to ask the pastor. So he went and asked the pastor and the pastor said, no, Sonny, no man can see God. No man can see God and live. You just can't do it. So the little fellow was disappointed. He associated with an old fisherman who lived on the river. And one day there's up around close to, (coughs) pardon me, the Six Mile Island and they come up a storm. (coughs) Excuse me. And they come up a storm, and the waters, you know how it gets after the rain, the leaves are all washed off. The old fisherman got back out in the boat and started down the river pulling his boat. And just as an oarman or any boatman knows uh, the harmony of that tip of the wave on the oars like that is he bringing down, is pulling a box of fish behind. And there was a sun come out in the west over this way and was looking towards the east. The old fisherman was, and there come a rainbow across the skies. And the little fellow was sitting in the stern of the boat. And so he began to notice the old fisherman with his gray beard. Tears began to run down his cheeks as he looked at that rainbow going along. And the little fellow got enthused and he ran up to the center of the boat, grabbed the old fisherman by the knees and fell down there at his feet. He said, sir, I'm going to ask you a question. My Sunday school teacher, my mother, my pastor, no one could answer. Could anybody see God? And the old fisherman so overcome, he just pulled the oars in the boat, threw his arms around the little boy. He said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 50 years has been God. There's so much God on the inside of him. Everything he looked at was God. That's how you see God is when you get God inside of you. Let him look through your eyes. That's how you work for God. When God can use your hands, use your feet, use your lips, use your tongue, use your ears. Use your eyes. God in you sees God on the outside. God is in his universe. He was in the rainbow. Settled a question there that none of them could settle. I'm a hunter, as you all know. My mother's a half Indian. And I, and my conversion never taken that out of me. I still go up into Colorado where I'm a licensed guide. And I ever fall and go way high in the mountains where I used to herd cattle for years and sat there many times, learned so much about God. I remember sitting there, my leg across where the Hereford Association uh, grazes the the, um, Troublesome River Valley, watching the ranchers as we bring in the cattle, putting them up in springtime to herd. And here's one thing, reason I'm interdenomination. The ranger stood there at the drift fence and he watched those cattle. If you can raise a ton of hay on your ranch, we'll produce as many tons of hay, it'll put a cow on the forest. I guess you still had the same laws here. And then the rancher standing there watching those cattle, he never paid very much attention to what brand they had on them. Ours was a tripod and the other main above us was turkey uh, track and just above there was Grimes, the big outfit that had the bar, diamond bar. And many of the, some of them put hundreds and hundreds of head of cattle on there. But you know, that, that ranger never noticed them brands. He watched for the blood tag in the ear. You couldn't put a herfer on that forest without, or a cow on that forest without being a third bred herfer. It had to be a registered Hereford. And I think at the day of the judgment, God will not notice whether I belong to the assemblies or the church of God or what church I belong to. The brand that I wear, he'll look for the blood tag, the blood of his own son. That's what he will look for. Nothing will go in there but a born again Christian. Hunting elk, the elk way up high this year because there'd been no snow to run them down. And Mr. Jeffries, which was one of the owners of one of the ranches, we knowed every bit of ground throughout that the forest land there for a hundred miles because we'd or I'd herded cattle and salted them and so forth. Take the pack trains and go back and salt the cattle. 
and round them up and so forth. And we went hunting, and he's a marvelous good hunter. And he had tucked to the left to go back over on the what we call the West Fork. I tucked the East Fork. And we'd meet in four or five days and have our elk hung up and whatever we was going to get. And then put our horses together and get the packs and come along and bring them down. I was way high, walking around up there. And there'd been, been no snow to mount anything. And, and in the fall of the year, high in the mountains, it'll snow, then rain, and then sun will shine. You know how it is, the changing of the weather along uh, October. And I was walking way high, almost timberline. And there come up a, a, a northerner and... The skies turned green for a little while, and oh, it started blowing and raining and, and sleeting. And I got behind a tree and just stood behind the tree, set my rifle down. There's an old blowdown close. And I set my rifle down there, and I was just thinking, Oh God, how great thou art. How wonderful you are. Your soul, you made the mountains, you poured forth the fountain, raised up the mountain. Lord, keep your precious hands on me. And as I stand there waiting for the rain to blow over, and then the winds got real heavy, and after the storm was over, I heard an old male elk begin to bugle. He got lost in the storm. Way up on the side of the hill, a coyote hollered. The mate answered down farther. You know when David said, the deep calleth to the deep. There's something about it was godly to me. Here in wildlife calling, there was that elk. I turned around and looked back towards the west, towards Washington here, and where the sun was going down and setting through the crevices of the mountains, looked like a great eye looking. I thought, that's right, his eyes run to and fro upon the earth. Everywhere you look was God, just godly. And then I looked back this way and there was a rainbow back this way on the, where the evergreens had froze over from the rain and formed the sun against it made a rainbow across the valley. The wolf a holler, the elk a bugling. The sun setting. Oh, my. I stood there crying like a baby. And I looked back. I said, yeah, what's in the rainbow? It's a covenant, a promise. Revelations 1, he was to look upon a jasper and sardis stone. That's Benjamin and Reuben, the first and the last. He that was, which is, and shall come, the root and offspring of David, the morning star. What all he was, his titles. There he is in the rainbow setting there. And I thought, oh, how beautiful, how it's good to be here. And I got so happy till I went around and around that tree just as hard as I could. Screaming to the top of my voice about 35 miles from a human being. And I was just a screaming and a shouting. I guess if someone would have come in the woods, they thought it, somebody got out of the insane institution up there. I was just a screaming and a shouting. I didn't care. I was worshiping God. I was just having me a good time. And I'd stop and i think, that's right. He's Alpha and Omega. Same yesterday, today, and forever. And around, around, around the tree, I go again, just as hard as I go. Just had to let off some of the steam. You know, it's just something is boiling, and I just screamed to the top of my voice. Natural on, I heard a little pine squirrel. I don't know whether you brother know what they are or not. He's a blue coat policeman of the woods. Jumped up on a stump there. Chatter, 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 chatter. I thought, well, what are you so excited about, little fella? I'm worshiping the God that created you and around and around the tree went again, just as hard as I could. And I thought, well, I'm worshiping the very God that created you. He's my creator. I love him. I'm worshiping. And around the tree, I kept going. That's while I said, don't you like that? You ought to do it yourself. You're a creature of God. You ought to worship him yourself. Come to find out he wasn't watching me. He'd cock his little head sideways and look down in that blowdown. And the winds had blown an old eagle down in there. Now, eagle's one of my favorite birds. So... God likens his prophets to eagles. He, he t- says himself, he's, he's the eagle himself, Jehovah eagle. Maybe the Lord willing, I'd like to preach on that one time for he's the eagle stirs its nest. And then, so then when he was looking over the side like that, he was watching this eagle down there. And this big eagle jumped out there, his great big gray looking eyes. And I thought, oh, that's what excited you. Mm-hmm. Well, I got to studying that. I thought, Lord, I know you're in that bugle of that elk. You're in the call of that wolf. You're in the rainbow. You're in the setting sun. You're in me. You're just everywhere. You're in all the flowers. You're, you're just everywhere. Now, how could you ever stop me from worshiping you to let me see that old eagle standing there? Now, there's nothing about him. He's a robber. <laughs> well, what about him? I said, what'd you bring him up for? What's, I see God out there, but I can't see God in that old eagle. Well, I happened to notice there. I said, say, fella, you know I could shoot you? <laughs> now, he knows I was admiring him. I like his bravery. He was watching. I noticed him. Why aren't you scared of me? And I noticed him taking his wings, you know, his feathers and feeling them like that. He just, I thought, oh, I see. I see, Lord. See, he's not scared. He's got two God-given wings. 
He knows before I could touch that rifle, he could be in that timber there and I wouldn't see him no more. See? And I thought if he could, if that eagle, by God-given gift of two wings to take him away from, from troubles, how much more ought a church when they can feel the power of the Holy Ghost around them? What ought we to do? Be able to fly away by faith from every sickness, every disease, and everything of the world. If we can feel the presence of God, as long as them feathers was running right, he knowed he could do it because he had confidence in the gift that God had given him. And yet we sat and wander and plunder with the very power of the Holy Ghost upon us and in walk moving through the building, showing that he's present. Why, you see God anywhere you look. Don't you believe that? God's in the eagle. God's in the wolf call. God's in the sunset. God's in his universe. God's in his flower. Well, God's everywhere. If you'll just look around. To finish that story, that old eagle, I watched him for a little bit, and this little old, uh, little old pine squirrel sat up there looking at me, you know, chatter, chatter, looking at the eagle, and after a while, the eagle got enough of it. So he just made one big jump, flopped his wings about twice, he was gone. Now, I, I noticed him, he never moved his a feather after that. When he got above that green timber, he just set his wings, he knew how to do it. And when that wind coming up the mountain, every time the wind would come in, whew, he just ride up on it, ride up on it. I stood and looked at it. Oh my. He just got smaller and smaller until he went plumb out of sight. And I thought, that's it. That's it, Lord. See, it isn't when you're sick or needy, it isn't flop, flop to this, take your letter over to this church and the assemblies don't treat you right, go to the church of God and they don't treat you right, go back to the Baptist. That isn't it. It's just knowing how to set your wings of faith into the power of God and right away from it. And the Holy Spirit begins to move just right up on it. It ain't flop, 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 flop. Well, I'll go over here if you don't treat me right. I'll go back over here. I'll go through Robert's prayer line. Brother Branham's coming. I'll go through his. That's not it. Set your faith in God's power and move away. Amen. He left that little old chipmunk or squirrel sitting there going, chatter, chatter, chatter. Days of miracles past. No such thing as divine healing. No baptism of the Holy Ghost. He just rolled away from it. <laughs> That's what we want to do. Rise above it. Get away from them people that says there's no such a thing as divine healing. God doesn't keep his word. Jesus Christ is not the same yesterday and forever. Just set your wings in the power of God and move away. That's right. Worn out of sight. Leave him set alone. Just be so deaf you don't even hear him at all. Just move away from it. God is in his universe. God moves amongst his creatures. Take a little old duck. I go up in the north woods sometimes to hunt. Hunted the world over. Go up in the north woods. There's a little old duck born up there on that lake. He never was off that lake. He's born there that spring. But somehow or another, when the snow caps come on the mountains, that first little cold breeze comes down across the mountain, there's a certain little duck on that pond. He's a little old drake. He gets right out there in the middle of that pond, sticks that little honker up in the air and goes, honk, honk. And every duck on the pond will come to him. Yes, sir. What will he do? He'll rise off of that. Remember, he never was off that pond. But he'll come right up off of that pond and lead, lead every one of them ducks just as straight to Louisiana to the rice fields as he can go. If he doesn't, it'll all be froze over. Surely we ought to have duck sense if uh, God can use the instinct of a duck to lead his people or his duckling friends away from a place that would freeze. Surely the power of the Holy Ghost ought to lead us to Christ who is our healer. And away from danger. God gave a duck instinct. He gave you the Holy Ghost. Oh, I feel religious right now. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, he gave us the Holy Ghost to escape those things. Certainly. You take, uh, uh, turn on your radio and say, tomorrow it's going to be cold weather. Or going to be uh, uh, hot weather. Whatever the uh, radio would say. We'll say, for instance, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be warm tomorrow. It'll be warm. And you watch that old sow hog. Go over there and take them sticks that's on the north side of the hill. Carry it over the other side of the hill. Don't you pay no attention to what that radio man says. He don't know what he's talking about. That hog does. You go out and watch these rabbits get right down under the brush and let the man say, it's going to be fair weather. Don't you pay no attention to what he says. That rabbit knows more than he'll ever know about that. God's given him a way to escape the things that he believes in it. And he makes ready for it. Like Noah did with the ark. He prepared the ark before any rain fell. Hey man, are you ready this afternoon to fly away? Can you see God? Get away from these sicknesses and diseases and doubts and frustrations. God's in his universe. 
Not long ago, a few years ago, Dad and I were plowing. And this hot morning, we was laying by a car. And, and Dad said, to, well, the horse is beginning to snort. And snort. And I said, what's the matter with him, Daddy? Is there a coyote or something back there? He said, no, no, it's coming up a storm. I said, a what? He said, a storm? I said, I don't see any storm anywhere. He said, Billy, stop a minute. He said, you don't understand. He said, God has given a horse an instinct that when a storm is coming, all you ever rode a horse know how lightning will play right over his mane. He said, he's got, he's got an instinct to get to safety. That's the reason he's snorting. They're wanting to get to the barn. And I said, a storm? Well, I said, there isn't a thunder, there isn't a lightning, there isn't a cloud anywhere. He said, but you just watch a few minutes. I hadn't plowed two rounds, so here comes the storm. See, God gave them instinct. God is in every creature, everywhere, if you'll just watch it. God's in his universe. You believe it? Amen. Certainly he is. Now, here some years ago, I was reading an article where an infidel crossed across the country, so smart, so intellectual, till ministers wouldn't even tackle him. It was about 50 years ago. And he, um, he is converting people from Christianity to infidelism. And finally he got broke down in his health. And he went to Colorado for a rest. One day he was in a camp and he walked out and he began to look at those rocks. And he said, is it true? Am I wrong? Did, did, is there a being that put you there? When them trees are waving back and forth in the wind. Adam, where art thou? I see. And finally, that infidel sitting out there on a log, looking at those rocks, fell on his face and said, I'm wrong. God be merciful to me, a sinner. No one in the scripture said, if they hold their peace, the rocks will immediately cry out. Something's going to happen. If a man looks around in the universe, he can find God. Don't you believe God is in his universe? Certainly God is in his universe. Now, we're going to take God in his word just for a minute. How many believe God's in his universe? Sure is in his universe. We could go on all afternoon, but we don't want to. We want to hit these other two points. Now, can you see God in his universe? How many can see God in his universe and all these different things? Sure you can. Now, let's see if God's in his word. God is in his word so much that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God is in his word. We believe that. He keeps it. We can tell it. When God speaks anything, we watch that word comes right down. It's manifested. Just exactly what he says comes to pass. So we know God is in his word. He told Abraham he's going to have a baby by Sarah. And he waited 25 years. God kept his word. Told Noah it was going to rain. And all the things that he told. He told 120 that go up and wait at Jerusalem until the day of Pentecost had fully come. He's going to send the promise of the Father. He kept his word. He always keeps his word. He said, these things that I do shall you also. He keeps his word. A little while in the world, the world order, will see me no more, yet you'll see me. I'll be with you, in you, to the end of the world. He keeps his word. God is in his word. Here, as I said tonight, God is, the word of God is a seed, Jesus said, that a sower went for sowing. And this seed, uh, uh, it sprung up and, and so forth. Now, every seed, if it's the right kind of seed, it will produce what it is. It will reproduce itself again. Some few, about three years ago or four, I was sitting at a, at a confectionery eating a, an ice cream with an old Methodist preacher friend of mine. He's gone on to glory now. And we were sitting there talking about the goodness of God. He was the same old minister that made up that song. We let down the bars. We let down the bars. We compromised with sin. We let down the bars. The sheep got out. But how did the goats get in? <laughs> I said, well, that's easy. You let on the bars. That's all. You just begin to compromise. And that's how the goats got in, eating up all the sheep's food. And they don't like that. They have to have weeds, ecclesiastical weeds. Goats get, get you know, satisfied with weeds, but a sheep has to have real food. So notice, while he was there, the radio was uh, on in the little confectionery at Henryville, Indiana, where we were with old Dr. Spurgeon, a very fine friend of mine. And so... Uh, the radio was on and the agriculture hour was on. And the little 4-H club in Louisville, Kentucky had a machine over there that they had uh, made a, a machine that could reproduce a grain of corn so perfect that you couldn't tell it from one grow to the field. Said you take a handful out of the sack that's grown in the field, handful out of the sack that the, that the um, a machine produced, mix them together, and you'll never tell them apart again. Said you cut them open, the same amount of calcium, the same amount of moisture, the heart just right, it make the same corn meal, the same corn bread, the same corn flakes, just exactly. Said there's only one way you can ever tell them apart. That's burial. 
And the one that the machine made rots and never lives again, but the one that God made lives again because it's got life in it. You can take a man that looks like a Christian, acts like a Christian, but if that man hasn't got the Word of God in him, if there is no germ of life in there that germatize that, he'll never rise in the resurrection. That's right. Because he can't rise. There's nothing in there to raise him up again. A seed. Now, when you bury a seed, you farmers, you take and go out here and plant your corn. You don't go out every morning and scratch it up and say, let's see now, is it growing? Anything happen to it? No. Put it back down. Late the next day, say, I want to see if it's getting along all right. Scratch it up again. It'll never grow like that. Well, the thing you do with the seed, you commit it to the ground. Cover it up. That's all you can do about it. It's up to God to do the rest of it. Well, that's the same way it is with the Word of God. If you'll take any divine promise God made in His Bible, put it in your heart, and water it every day with praises of God that's going to come to pass, it'll grow if you don't quit fooling with it. If you'll just leave it alone. Don't say, let me see, can I move my finger any better today? Uh, do I feel any better? Is my headaches a little bit better? Or are all? It'll never be that. Just commit it to God and walk away and leave it alone. That's God's seed. It'll grow. Some time ago, I was up at uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I got a scorching letter that morning, and it had been a snowstorm that night, and I went back in a little old cheap hotel, and I always try to stay in a place. I don't believe Christians ought to ask for the best that there is in the land. A Christian ought to be humble. I, I think that's, even if you could afford it, I still think we ought to be an example. My Lord didn't even have a place to lay his head. The foxes had dens and the birds had nests, but he didn't have a place to lay his head. Come to the world, borrowed a manger to be born in, come through a barred womb, went out in a barred grave. <laughs> and the God of heaven. And we are to show some humility too. So I went in and there was a 22-page letter from a certain dean of a college. Oh, if he didn't rake me over the coals. He said, Mr. Branham, you wouldn't call me brother. He said, Mr. Branham, the very idea of you standing before as many people as you do, and then such a rotten theology, I never heard of it in my life. And said, you was bragging about you being preaching for 31 years. Said, young feller, I was preaching before you was born. And I thought, well, that's, I certainly respect the man has been preaching that long. So then I said, well, that's all right. So he said, the very idea you said last night that... Uh, that uh, the servant of God said, I drove 15 miles through a blinding snowstorm to hear a servant of Christ. And what did I find but a polished up soothsayer? Well, he said, and you said the devil couldn't heal. He said, a man that would teach to as many people as you teach to and know no more about the Bible and that and know no more than, than a devil cannot heal. He said, I'll give you to understand that I live in a community here where there's a woman with a familiar spirit. Said they come up to this woman, she got a big apron on. She feels all around over them like this, and they drop some money in this apron. Said then she takes some hairs out of her head and plucks their veins and put blood on his hair, walk down to a little stream behind her and throw it in. The people stand in front of her. She walks up like this, and she's compelled to look back. But said then the disease comes back on the people. If it doesn't, she casts it off through her through the blood of the people and her own hair in the stream. And said, We kept record of that. Said at least twenty or thirty percent of them people are healed. And then you need to tell me that you don't believe a devil can heal. Well, I, I just thought a dean of a college. Well, I thought that's too nice for a letter. So the first thing, I said, I got to answer him. And if you ever read one of my letters, I'm the only one that can read it. So then and I, I sat down and done the very best I could. And I said, my precious brother, because he just called me Branham. And I, I said, my precious brother. And I meant that. A man had been preaching for 50 years. He deserves something. Now, although if he's wrong, he deserves something. I said, my precious brother, I said, the first thing I want to say, that I forgive you for what you said, and I pray that God does too. Remember, the Pharisees that have been preaching a lot longer than you had, seen that same thing done and said it was the power of a devil, a Beelzebub, and Jesus said that when it was done by the Holy Ghost in this last days, to speak one word against it would never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. Now, for instance, what if I am right? Then your 50 years of preaching means nothing. You've damned your soul to hell forever. You'd never be forgiven for it. I said, I would, brother, that through ignorance you did it. And I said, don't let that hurt your feelings. But I said, then you were keep pushing me about me, my theology, saying that a devil could not heal. I said, I'll give you Jesus. You can't make the scripture get all bundled up. You've got to keep it clear and straight. Right. I said, Jesus said Satan cannot heal, and you said he healed. Now, I said, now, if you'll pardon me, I said, I, I will give you what about your witch that you got in your neighborhood. I said, of course those people get healed. 
Because I said in Africa, I've seen them go to idols and get healed. In La Salarines, they got a monument. There's some dead woman in the Catholic Church. They go there and look at that dead woman, say, Hail Mary, and get healed. Sure, because the people think they're approaching God through that, and God heals on the basis of faith, and wherever faith met, God's got to meet that requirement. Right. I said, there's many people in the country today call themselves divine healers. Said, I got power in my hands. Glory. Hallelujah. Ooh, feel that? And American people fall apart like, I don't know what, like hot cakes to the bum. And they, and they, they think that's right. They're getting healed because they're, that ain't it. Your faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's where healing lays. But you never let anybody tell you they got power to heal. They haven't. Jesus Christ has already paid the debt. How can you redeem it again? Give you a clear receipt from the pawn shop that you was in. You're redeemed. By the precious blood of Jesus. You don't have power to heal. The thing you do is have, you might have a gift to manifest God. You might have a gift to manifest him through a great preacher, like some of these, my brethren, who could far better stand here and do this job than I could, because that's her calling. My calling is something else. But each one of us was a gift to try to tell you that Christ healed you when he died for you. He was wounded for your transgressions with his stripes. You were healed. It's something to make you know. If you can't believe the word, then he sends signs and wonders then to prove that he is the resurrected Christ. See, therefore, that's where you get your healing, by believing on him. Now, so then I said, but the thing that I'm worried about, mister, is not that, but that a dean of a Lutheran college would place his doctrine up on a sensation, and on an experience, instead of placing it up on the word of God. Yeah. Oh, you can have any kind of a sensation, but it's got to be the word of God. That's right. I said, a dean of a college been preaching for 50 years and would base your doctrine, that cut him pretty hard, base your doctrine upon, a, upon some kind of an experience that a woman had instead of basing it upon the word of God. God said Satan cannot heal and that settles it. Amen. When he speaks, it's eternally right. Not long after that, I got an invitation to come to his place. Mr. Moore went with me because I know that man was smart. And so we, after we had dinner out there at that great famous college, and they had hundreds of acres of corn where the students could work their way through, that day after dinner he pushed his plate back. The dean of the college said to me, he said, Mr. Branham, we come here to ask you some questions. I said, I may not be able to answer them, sir. I said, I'm not a theologian. I'm just a brother. <laughs> Praise for the sick. And he said, uh, well, he said, but Mr. Moore, which is a theologian, sat by me. And he said, if he gets too wild for you, just touch me on the knee. So with my knee. So I was saying there and he said, um, Mr. Branham, I see that you tracing your life back. You're a Baptist. I said, I was. And he said, um, uh, what happened? Why would you leave the Baptist church? I said, I never left it. It left me. Thing. I said, it left me when it denied the message I was preaching in the Bible. And he said, uh, well, Mr. Branham, there's one thing I'd like to ask you. He said, is this. He said, now, if you did that, I would like to say one thing. What made you take up with the Pentecostals? I said, they believe the word. He said, what have they got? He said, I've been around and seen them kick over the tables, knock over the chairs. And I said, oh, sure. That's right. Knock out a window or something like that. I said, sure. So what is it? I said, Holy Ghost. And he said, the Holy Ghost. I said, sure. If they won't make the wheel roll right, they got to blow it out the whistle somewhere. They got a lot of steam. I said, that's the truth. If this Pentecostal church would take a lot of its praises and put it to work, it would do something for the kingdom of God. God give you the Holy Ghost, you like to shout by it and praise by it. But just put that into gifts and wonders and go out on the street and get sinners to come in and things like that. Your church will grow and everything will go along all right. Don't blow it out the whistle. Put it into action and let it make the wheel roll, the gospel train. And he said, well, uh, what do you think we Lutherans has got? Do you think that we believe that we receive the Holy Ghost when we believe? I said, Paul would differ with you in Acts 19. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He never said, now you take that through the Greek, Hebrew, or whatever you wish you, it's since you believe. Now they believe, our Baptist church taught you to receive the Holy Ghost when you believe, but it's not right. Paul said, you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And those people were shouting while Aquila and Priscilla, and they had great meetings and everything was going on. But he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we know not where there be any Holy Ghost. When Paul had baptized them over and laid hands up on them and the Holy Ghost come on them, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Then they had the Holy Ghost. So he said, what do you think we Lutherans has got? I said, potentially, I think you're all right. He said, I said, let me just give you a little parable because I don't know just exactly. I said, now, what do you do here? You go out and you plow up your field in the springtime. You rake all the stalks out of it. You plant your corn. Next morning you go out. And the first thing you know, you say, these two little shoots comes up on corn. 
two little blades. And I say, you look out and see them little shoots coming. You say, praise the Lord. I got a corn crop. I said, have you got a corn crop? He said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, potentially you have a corn crop. I said, that was you Lutherans. First Reformation. And then the first thing you know, that stalk growed on up. These leaves got big. And the first thing you know, it went into a tassel. That was John Wesley on the second Reformation. Sanctification. Second definite work of grace. Then what did it do? I said, the tassel looked back down to the stalk and to the leaf and said, I have no need of you. We got sanctified. You're just Lutherans. And I said, after a while, the pollen went forth and fell down into the, the leaf of the corn and come forth and had an ear, a grain of corn. I said, that was a Pentecostal. I said, then the Pentecost looked up and said, I have no need of either of you. But I said, after all, the same life that was in the two little blades made the tassel and also made the grain. Right. I said, we see, Pentecost is a restoration. Pentecost has the Holy Spirit, but a restoration of the gifts. The same grain, the same Jesus that went into the ground is reproducing himself, come up through the stalk, and now reproducing himself in the fullness in the original grains like it went down. Amen. Amen. He said, what would you call us? I said, the Pentecostal church is an advanced Lutheran church. <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. It's the advanced Lutheran and Nazarene and Pilgrim Holiness and all. It's just the advanced church. I said, I'll admit we got a lot of fungus on the ear, but we got some grains there too, praise Amen. God. It's, it's the original. God is in his word and the word is a seed. No matter what happens, it's going to grow anyhow. God said it would be there without spot or wrinkle. You believe God's in his word? God takes his word. God keeps his word. God keeps his promise of his word. What he does, he does it. God's in his universe. Amen. God's in his word. Believe that? Now, God in his son, I got wrote down here. God in his son. All right. Is God in his son? The Bible said he was. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, if you want this, two, this, three, this, four, this, and whatever you are, well, just get this in your mind right now. You, you shake hands and say, we're brothers. Look, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Jesus was the son of God that God overshadowed Mary, created in the womb a blood cell. Now, you've heard people say, we were saved by Jewish blood. We could not be saved by Jewish blood. It's just as sinful as any other blood. We were saved by the blood of Gentile? No, sir. We wasn't even saved by human blood. We were saved by the blood of God. God's blood. The, the germ of life comes from the blood cell, and the blood cell here came from God the Creator, who created a blood cell that brought forth the Son of God. When the old worshiper took a lamb, went to the altar to worship, he laid it on there, put his hands on it, and confessed his sins. They cut its throat, broke the blood cell, the lamb died. Now, he went right away with the same condition he did when he come in. His sins were forgiven, but what he went with the same desire. If he stole, shot, committed adultery, whatever it was, he went back with the same desire. But if a man ever puts his hands upon the head of the Son of God, why didn't he go, did he go away like he would if he put his hands on the Son of God? The blood cell from that lamb had animal life in it. And that animal life will not coincide with human life. Therefore, when the life come back, it was animal life to the human life, and it couldn't do nothing for him. But when God's blood cell was broke, the Spirit of God living in that cell returns back in the form of the Holy Ghost. That man is free from sin. The very conscience of sin has been condemned. Amen. I believe that with all my heart. The worshiper once purged has no more desire of sin. The Bible says conscience, which really means desire. A worshiper once put his hands upon the head of Jesus Christ by faith and feel that quivering flesh like the man did on the lamb, dying, crying, an innocent one. And with all your heart, believing that Son of God died in your place. And when you make that confession, the Holy Spirit from that blood cell that sanctifies you comes into your life and you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. The life of God is in you and he's adopted you and you are a son of God. Amen. Amen. Don't get scared. Amen means so be it. <laughs> that won't hurt you. Notice, the Son of God, the Spirit of God is in the man. So God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God is the Spirit. He had no hands to become Jesus. He had no feet, arms, legs, and so forth to become Jesus. He manifested. No man has seen the Father at any time, but the only begotten has declared him. He, God, dwelt in the body of Christ. It ought to be striking. It ought to make man wonder. He could have come down from heaven, right down the corners of heaven with a full angel salute if he wanted to. 
He could have been born a full matured man. He could come down with all the pomp and glory of heaven. But he didn't choose that. He come to a stable, born over a manure pile. And little Jehovah crying in a manger. Little Jehovah playing as a boy. Little Jehovah tarning as a man. He, he crossed his cast with us. God become human. When Jesus Christ was born, God was human on earth, manifesting God, what he was. He toiled and labored and felt for the teenager. He, he went through every temptation that we go through. God did it that he might do his own judgment justice. He, his judgment has got to be justice. If there's no justice, what good does it do to have judgment? And if there's no judgment without penalty, then it's not judgment yet. So he took the penalty of his own judgment and died as a sinner to condemn the sin of the world that we, through his justice, might have reconciliation back to the throne of God in fellowship like we did in the Garden of Eden. That's not the gospel. I don't know it. It's exactly right. The precious Son of God. Sure, God was in his Son. Not calling any different religions. I don't represent any of them. I represent them all. Here some time ago, I was at the Robinson Auditorium in Little Rock. There's an old man who's on crutches. He'd been called out, sold pencils on the corner for years. He was a Nazarene. The next day, he was going down the street holding these old crutches, saying, my old buddies, I'm through with them. Testifying. That night, I was got in the pulpit to preach, and he said, just a minute, Mr. Branham. I said, yes, sir. He's up in the balcony. And he said, uh, you know, when I heard you preach, I was sure he was a Nazarene. And he said, because you preach holiness. And he said, then I hear somebody tell me he was a Baptist. Nearly all these people are Pentecostals. I said, I don't understand that. I said, oh, Dad, that's easy. I said, I'm a Pentecostal Nazarene Baptist. <laughs> that, that's it. We are representatives of Jesus Christ. That's the thing. Not your denomination, your God. Now, this woman belonged to a Christian science church. Very fine lady. And she said, of course, they do not believe in the, uh, Jesus being divine. She said, Mr. Branham, I enjoy your teaching, but said the only thing that makes my blood shiver is you trying to make Jesus divine. Said you brag too much on him. I said, I can't brag enough on him. She said, well, you're always bragging about him, bragging about him. I said, if I had 10,000 tongues, I couldn't brag about him enough. I said, what he's done for me. She said, but you make him divine. I said, he was divine. If he wasn't divine, the whole world's lost. That's exactly right. She said, if I, you said you was a fundamentalist, you just stayed with the Bible. I said, that's right. She said, if I'll prove to you by the Bible he wasn't divine, will you accept it? I said, if the Bible said he wasn't, I would. I said, but the Bible doesn't say it. She said, oh, yes, it does too. I said, where's that? She said, all right. And first in St. John, the 11th chapter, when Jesus is going down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said he wept. I said, Mr. Branham, he could not weep and be divine. Well, I said, lady, your argument is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken and starved to death. I said, well, you, well, that's no scripture. I said, looky here. He was both God and man. I said, he was a man when he wept at the grave of Lazarus. But when he pulled his little shoulders up and said, Lazarus, come forth. And a man had been dead four days, stood on his feet and lived again. That took more than a man. That took divinity to do that. God was in Christ. He was a man coming off the hill that night hungry, looking down along that morning, rather, looking for food on that a fig tree and found on. He was a man when he was hungry, but when he took five biscuits and two fish and fed 5,000, that was more than a man. That was God living in a man. Sure it was. He was a man when he was tired, laying on that little old boat out there that night. Virtue had gone from him from visions and things to the day. Un- the devil swore that night, probably 10,000 of them of the sea, that they drowned him. And there he was, that little old ship out there, tossed about like a bottle stopper in a storm on a mighty sea. There he was, floating about like that, and him laying in the back of the ship, the waves never even woke him up. Sleeping, so he was tired and weary. He was a man when he was asleep. But when once the rivals, hallelujah. Oh! When he's put on the rail of the boat and said, Peace, be still. And the winds went to its coals like a baby to its... The winds and the waves obey. That took more than a man to do that. That took God. That took inspiration. That took the power of divinity to do that. God was in his son. Do you believe that? When he had died on the cross, he did cry for mercy. He was a man. He was crying for mercy on the cross. But on Easter morning, when he rose up and broke the seals of death and hell and rose again out of the grave, 
He was more than a man. It takes more than a man to rise from the grave. It takes God to do that. No other poet said, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh glorious day. Yes, sir. In him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You believe God's in his universe? Do you believe God is in his word? Do you believe God was in his son? Now the next thing I hear is God in his people. Now let's see if we can bring him to his people. God is a spirit, and he's always used man to manifest himself on earth. He did it in his son. He was, God was in David. Did you know that? God was in his people. David, when he was rejected king, went up the top of the hill, looked back weeping as a rejected king. Five hundred years later, the son of David sat on the same hill as a rejected king and wept over Jerusalem. Is that right? Joseph had Christ in him. When he was born, a spiritual brother. His other brothers hated him. Watch that church today. The other brothers hated him without a cause. He was loved of his father, hated by his brethren. Now, they hated him without a cause. He couldn't help because he was born to see visions and interpret dreams. But they hated him. They do it today. The same thing. The devil takes his man, but never his spirit. God takes his man, but never his spirit. The Spirit is up on Elijah, come up on Elisha, and from Elisha to John the Baptist and predicted to come again in the last days. See? God took the Spirit out of his son, sent it back to the church. God takes his man, but never his spirit. The devil takes his man, but never his spirit. Those two spirits have warred against one another in human flesh since the beginning of time. Right. And they war on to the end. If you just study the scriptures and watch the way it works, you'll not be lost. If you'll accept him as your savior and as your guide to guide you through the scriptures and while we're sailing over life, Solomon, in your little bark. Let him come in with you and pilot your ship. Now we find God was in uh, uh, Moses. God was in Elijah. That was Elijah, a man laying back out in the, the cave out there, the Shunammite woman, and he had blessed and she'd had a baby. And the baby died. And Elijah come on the scene. Elijah was a man of God. When he come in, the baby was laying on his bed. First, Elijah knew that he was a man of God. He didn't brag about it and pop off about it, but he knew he was a man of God. So he had had it walked on this old stick. And he said, told to Gehazi, take that stick and go lay it on the baby. He knew that everything he touched was blessed because God was in him. If he get the woman to believe the same thing. That's the way the woman touched the bar of, the, of Jesus' garment because she knew he was a godly man that God dwelt in his people. Amen. And she knew if God was in Elijah, surely he was in Jesus. She knew that if we Pentecostal people could respect one another like that, knowing that we'd never talk about one another, we'd be brothers, we'd be sisters, there'd never be no disgrace amongst us if we could recognize one another what we are, sons and daughters of God, and God dwells in His church and His people. Certainly it is. God's in His people. You believe that? Look at this prophet. The woman didn't believe in the staff. I think that's where Paul got the handkerchiefs taken from his body. Because I believe Paul wouldn't preach nothing but what was in the Word. So he sent the handkerchiefs to the people. God was in Paul. And the people took handkerchiefs from Paul's body, laid them on their body, and devils went out of them and diseases was healed. God was in a man. You believe that? Paul. God was in Elijah. Called on the scene of a dead baby. He didn't know what to do. The baby's dead. So he just walked back and forth up and down the floor. Oh, I like that. Waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Walking to and fro in the room. And after a while he began to feel the Spirit coming on him. I believe he picked up a little bit, no, walking a little faster. Oh, he felt the Spirit laid himself on the baby, and the baby sneezed seven times and come to life. God and his people. What could bring life back from death but God? Amen. I feel real religious right now. Oh, my. You think a Baptist don't shout? I sure do. Oh, God in his people. That was an old fisherman. Didn't have... Today we watch for the intellectual, the big guy that's been through college and knows all the degrees and got the DDD and PhDs and all kinds of DDs. And so then the first thing you know, he gets up there, you know, and he knows all about it. We think that's the guy. But God got a little old fisherman one time under his control. He couldn't even sign his own name, illiterate, unlearned. And the people seen God working in that man. Until they actually laid in the shadow of that fisherman and was healed, everyone his shadow passed over. God's in his people. Do you believe that? God is in his universe. Do you believe that? God is in his word. Do you believe that? God is in his son. Do you believe that? God is in his people. Do you believe that? 
Look last night when we was talking about the works that I do shall you also. We took the works that he did and showed what it was. He promised he would be here. You say, but God lived in another age. God lives forever. God's eternal. God can't die. God, they killed the body of Jesus, but God raised it up again. And he's alive forevermore. His spirit lives in the church today. His spirit is here now. His spirit's among his people. He proves himself. Not with some... He can prove himself alive by this. He can prove himself alive by the sunset. He can prove himself alive by his word. He can prove himself alive by his spirit that's in the building now. By men and women who will commit themselves to him. Hey, man. You commit yourself to him. Say, what happens, Brother Branham, when you see those visions? It's nothing in the world but just having a gift to know how to relax myself. Get William Branham off the side. That's the biggest enemy I got is William Branham. He's always in my way. <laughs> He's always in God's way, I'll say. He always gets in God's way. He's too tired. He don't want to do this. He don't want to do that. If I can just crucify that guy, God can use it. God can use this body. Here's this microphone. It's a mute. Till I speak in it or somebody speaks in it, but it can't speak itself. How can a man see a vision? How could a man heal a sick person? How could laying on of hands bring a dead baby to life or so forth? How could it ever do? It's not man. It's God in that man. Just the same as God in the sunset. God's everywhere. We want to be born of his spirit and recognize him. Watch for him. He's so close to you. He's not only close to you, you born again people. He's already in you. Trying to will his, and the devil stand there and say, don't believe it, don't believe it, don't believe it. This, it, it ain't for you, it's not for another day. Oh, say, get thee behind me, Satan. It is written. The works that I do shall you also. That's what Jesus defeated Satan. He never used his power. He was God manifested in flesh, but he didn't use his power. All the gifts that there was in heaven, he had them in him, but he didn't use that. He stuck the Father's word. He said, it's written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. And he defeated Satan. And the word of God will defeat Satan anywhere, on any grounds, under any conditions. God's holy word. God lives in his universe. God lived in his word. God lives in his son. God lives in his people. He's God everywhere. If you just let him in now, you'll see God live again this afternoon among us. Let us bow our heads. For the word of God is sharper, more powerful than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the sunder and the mire of the bone. A discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God comes into a human being and discerns a thought. Jesus perceived their thought. If that's right, say amen. amen. What was he? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word was made flesh. And he said, you condemn me because I call myself the son of God. And it's written in your laws that ye are gods. Man was made to be a god. His domain is the earth. The whole earth's awaiting now for the manifestation of the sons of God to be made manifest. Look how far behind we are. But remember, the prophets, he said, if you call them gods who the word of God came to, what was a prophet? A divine interpreter of the word. Had the divine interpretation. The signs of him foretelling and foreknowing. That was a vindication to the people that he was a prophet. That's what the Jews says. Let us see him take this Bible. It says that Jesus was the Christ and died and rose again. The things that I did so will you. Let us see him do the sign of the prophet. We'll believe that that's the spirit. That was the Messiah. And he's working in his man again. It's his prophet. See? He is working in that. How can it be done only by God? God is the only one that can do that. Do you want to be remembered in prayer? Raise up your hand. Say, God, be merciful to me. I now want to believe with all my heart on the Lord Jesus. I know that I'm a creature that's, that's eternity bound. There was one time when you wasn't nothing, nowhere. But there never will be a time but what you'll be something or somewhere. If you're a sinner, make your decision this afternoon. Christ is here to help you, to save you. Would you, I'm not much on persuading people at an altar. I think if the word of God don't do it. Jesus said this remark, don't let it hurt you. All that the Father has given me will come to me. But no man can come except my Father draws him first. We just cast forth the net. Are you a sinner? Would you like to just raise up your hands? I'm not calling you to the altar. Just say, Brother Branham, I'm a sinner. I'll raise my hands to God. God, make me real that I can see you like the old fisherman. I want to see you all over your universe in your word. I want to see you. Raise up your hands. Say, pray for me, brother. God bless you. Someone else. 
Raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you back in the back. God bless you. What about the all uh, up in the balcony to my right? Will there be some up there with your heads bowed and your hearts too that doesn't know the Lord Jesus? Say, Brother Bram, remember me in your prayer as you pray. All Christians on that side, I'll leave it with you now. I remember what a Christian is. If you love the world or the things of the world, it's because of the love of God. Not any, we can't take this lightly. It's reality. It's real birth, real passing death to life. Balcony to my left. Will there be some there? Raise your hand and say, I'm not a Christian, Brother Bram. I wish you'd remember me in prayer. I'm not holding my hand to you as a preacher. I'm holding my hand to God. Let him be merciful to me. Is there any? All right. Down on the bottom floor again. Let's go through here. Is there another? So I'll be sure to know that I'm praying. I believe God hears my prayer. He told me, if you'll be sincere, get the people to believe you. Nothing will stand before your prayer. I said, they won't believe me because I'm uneducated. He said, as Moses is given two signs to vindicate that he was sent down for deliverance, so are you given two signs. Raise your hand. Say, I'd like to be remembered in prayer, Brother Branham. If there's another one on the floor that has not, raise your hand. All right. Our Heavenly Father, I commit them to thee. There is hands this afternoon that went up, two on the bottom floor that I noticed. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll touch those people at this hour. The people feel that they are satisfied that you're with them. And I thank you for that. Now, Father, if there's one shadow of doubt, may they not stand under that. May they be absolutely sure because that morning is going to be a terrible morning. The fog will be heavy at the river. I want to be sure that my ticket's right and everything's made right now. For that hour, I might not have a chance. I won't have a chance. There will be no mercy then. The blood will be off of the mercy seat. It will be a judgment seat. And I'll be asked to give an answer. God grant that these precious souls, that you touch their hearts. I pray that you'll save them right now. Let them know this, that you said in your word, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And they raise their hands, showing that there is a spirit that told them to raise their hands. They raise their hands towards heaven, to the creator of heavens and earth. Father God, I ask that you put their name on the book of life. May the blood of Jesus write it across their sinful book, pardon, throw it in the sea of forgiveness, remember it against them no more. And may their names be wrote new in the Lamb's book of life. That at that day, the, blood, the book will be sprinkled with the blood of the Lord Jesus, so there will be no sin against them. Grant it, Father, I commit them to thee. I don't get to shake their hands in this life. May I have that privilege that day when them tens of thousands stands there. May I hear him scream out, Brother Branham, I was the one that raised my hand at Yakima all that afternoon. They'll be so happy. The vision you showed the other night of how happy they were that it passed from this life to the other. Now, Father, I pray that you'll bless them. Now this afternoon as we call the prayer line, may you manifest yourself and confirm the word and be God in his people to us today as we see God in his universe. God in his Son, God in his Word, God in his people. Grant it, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. To you, dear people, I was thinking, I took that watch off. That's three straight watches. I take hold of somebody's arm with that, for that, the watch stops, it fell, I don't know, don't tell me what. The jewelry right here in the city just fixed it, he's trying to. And the stem come out, the face fell off the hand. It's a $300 Vulcan cricket that was given me in Switzerland with an alarm on it. See? And I had a brand new one here in California that was given. I put my hand on a person like that to pray for. Did anybody ever see that uh, was present when that was done? Raise up your hands if you have been when that taken place. And that thing stopped, come apart. I've never been able to use it to this day. Three straight watches. I took it off so I'd be sure. Now, we're going to... What was we was called last night? We had card. A, A. Would you give out... Uh, there's a hundred out altogether. We called from one to fifty, I believe, last night. And then you got so no one would come up. Now, look. I know it's startling. Yes, sir. It's great. If you come here with unconfessed sin, you better make it right before you come. See? Because it'll certainly call it right out. But this afternoon, I'm just going to take some of them prayer cards and pray for them. And then just pray for the people that's got the prayer cards. Let's begin this afternoon somewhere else in there. So if we get a couple on here, maybe for discernment or something. Let's start somewhere else along in that hundred. Let's see, we got up to around somewhere last night, 15 or 20 or something like that, and they got so they didn't come, and then I just... Let's start, say, 51. Is that card here? 51. Who has prayer card 51? Raise up your hand. A woman, all right, that's good to start with. Come right here, lady. 52. Who has prayer card 52? We'll get them all, but we just... All right. My son tells me that they can't hear in the building. Is that right? 
Can you hear me up in the balcony? Can't hear. Can you hear me over there? Well, bless your heart, sitting here all afternoon, can't even hear. Can't hear one thing in the balcony. Can't. Can you hear in the back? Hear back there, but can't hear up in the balconies. Well, bless your loyal hearts. May God, my Savior, grant to you your request, each one of you this afternoon. Can you hear that? God grant your request, whatever it is. If you sit there all this time and me speaking and couldn't hear a thing, may God in some other way reveal it to you that I'm telling you the truth. All right, we'll call the prayer line now. I'll have to say it out loud like this because of the people up there may have prayer cards. I'm calling from prayer card... Where was it? 52. Uh, prayer card... 52. All right, prayer card 52. Who has it? 53. You come right here, lady. 50. Lord Jesus, would you heal me? You'd say, child, I've already done that. Well, you've already done it. Now, wait a minute. That's a little... I heard you was a healer. I am a healer, he'd say. Well... Well, why don't you heal me? Well, child, I've already done it. I paid the price of your healing back there. I can never, never in my uh, days when I was on earth, neither can I now at any time ever do anything for anybody except they have faith to believe it first. How many knows that? That's the basis. It's got to be faith. All right? Now, they'd say, well, how do I know you're the Lord Jesus? Would you do something? Well, yes, I'll uh, hold up my hand. I'll preach a little while. But see, say, Lord... Let me know that it's you. He would have to do something like he did when he was here on earth. Is that right? Yes. Do something to make you know. Then what was the sign we found last night that he made them people know that he was the Messiah? How did he do it? He'd give them a Messiah sign to show that he was a prophet that Moses spoke of. He know the secret of their hearts. How many knows that? How many witnesses that the Bible says that? That the Lord your God shall raise a prophet like me. And Jesus perceived their thoughts. Know the secrets of their hearts. Spoke it out to them. And in that he manifested himself to be the Son of God. Now, if God is in his people, that same life that was in Jesus is here in the church. It's in you people. That woman pressing to the prayer line, she didn't have a prayer card, as we would say it. But she stayed back out in the audience. She touched the border of his garment. Now, Jesus today is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? Now, how would you know you touched him? He'd act the same way he did when he was here. Now, most time you people is crippled and so forth. You think I'm just a past hope. Get that out of your mind. It's no more for God for you to receive faith than it is for them to receive faith. Your healing is just as positive as theirs would be. If, if your healing is just as positive if you'll have the faith. Now, which is the where we get right here? This lady. All right, come here. Now, American people. Now we realize with fifty people. I did pack me off the platform after 10 or 15 and passed by for visions. Oh, yeah, I couldn't stand it. How many understands that? Jesus, with one vision, virtue went from him. And now what would one vision do to me? Now, here's a woman crippled in a wheelchair. I say, that woman's crippled. Anybody knows that. But here's a woman who looks healthy. Now, the miracle is, what's wrong with her? She looks fine and healthy. Now, if anybody's got a doubt of this and think that do you have a better way? Well, here's the microphone. You come right on up here. Yes. You, you're just welcome to come. You that don't, don't believe, you walk up here and do the same thing. You say, well, Jesus said the works that I do shall you also greater. Well, you said he said greater. Well, let's see you first do the works that he did, then do the greater. You do the first works he did. That's, then, you, then you'll do the greater. Let's see you do the first things he did. The works that I do shall he also then greater, if you'll take the translation, it says more than this shall he do. Because he couldn't do any greater, because he, he did about everything that could be done. But now, if this woman, now I'm just going to pray for the rest of the people down the line. But the people might know that the Holy Spirit is here. Now, I'm just going to see if God will give us the vision for this woman. Now, when he told me, these two signs will vindicate that you were sent to do this. Moses had two signs, he said. Moses went down there and performed the sign one time before Israel, and everyone believed him and marched 40 years. Is that right? Amen. Surely, if we're the sons of Abraham, we should have that much faith. Now, let's believe. Now, lady, the first place, I suppose we are strangers to one another. If we are strangers to one another, would you just raise up your hand so the people see I see. Here we are, not back in some dark corner like a devil, right out here like our Lord stood, like the woman at the well. 
Don't never be afraid of Christianity. Hang your soul on any promise. It's good. Christ died to make it good. Now, I wouldn't know why I say that if I didn't feel his presence here like the eagle felt his wings. Now, the woman, since she's been standing here, has become conscious that she's in the presence of something besides a man. Is that right, lady? If that's right, raise your hand. See, standing right over this woman, if you your eyes are spiritual, surely you can see it. Don't you see that light hanging right here? Right over the woman. It's kind of an emerald. How many have seen the picture of it? It's here in the meeting. They got it. Hanged in Washington, D.C. The only supernatural beam was ever, ever photographed to be proved scientifically. Here it is. I'm looking right at it. It's hanging over the woman because she's a believer. She's my sister. The Spirit witnesses back and forth. Now, the only thing I have to do is just catch something from her. Then what would happen? It would tell her something. She's either standing here for domestic trouble, financial trouble, sickness, or somebody else, or something. I don't know. I've never seen her in my life. Now, if the Holy Spirit will reveal to the woman something to... Now, if I said, yes, Jesus Christ is here, I feel his presence. She does, too. Now, watch how it is. It's a real sweet, humble, meek feeling. Is that right, lady? If it is, wave your hand back and forth to the audience. See, I'm watching the light right over. Now, for myself, I know I'm talking to an audience, but actually my intellectual, seemingly, is in another world. It's in a dimension. Another world. A lady has got trouble. It's on her chest. It's a gross. It's cancerous gross. She's had some operation or something for it. And it's, it's coming back gross on her chest. That will finally kill the woman. She's shattered with death. If that's right, lady, wave your hand. Now, do you believe? Now, be it you might know, watch devil power work. This woman, actually, on this year, while I'm still in the spirit, it's a tumor sort of a thing. Is that right? Right here sits another person, woman, sitting right here with a tumor. Is that right, lady? If it is, raise up your hand. But besides that, you got diabetes also. Let's raise up your hand. See, that spirit of darkness pulling across here, them two demons trying to catch one another, calling for help. But the power of God now, above every doubt in your ass, to ride over there. Thank you, Lord. See? Hallelujah. Now, do you believe? Amen. Is God in his people? Yes. You say, God's in you, Brother Branham? Not only me, he's in her and in her, too. Hallelujah. See? Here's the Holy Spirit here, which is infallible. There's a, a power of death in both of them, and them two deaths are trying to cooperate together while the power of God's revealing it, opening it up and showing that he loves them women. He wants them to be healed. Do you believe it? Amen. Now, please, please don't move around I, you broke the very channel. Don't do that. Please, please. You know these things will go from one to another? Be real ready. Lady, if God would tell me who you are, would he give you a lot of faith to believe? Your name is Miss Moore. Go on your road, both of you. Let both of you right down your hoop. Go on your road and do that. Let's say praise the Lord. Does that gift work? Now, how many remembers when I was here when I put my hand on somebody? And you'd see the, the black, the vibration on it. Now, if this woman has got a germ disease, it'll work. If it isn't a germ disease, it won't work. Because it'll have to be seen by vision. I don't know. You're the next patient? I'm not beside myself, but it just sometimes I... Come here just a minute, young lady. Let me have your hand just a moment. This hand right here. Correctly, it is a germ disease. Yes, sir. She's got an infection. Now... It's a lady's trouble. Female trouble. That's right. That's right. Raise your hand. That's exactly right. See? She's got an infection. That's a germ. Here it is on my hand. I want to show you something, young lady. Look here. Look at my hand. See those little white things bouncing over my hand there? Kind of swollen, dark red looking. I take your hand off of mine. That's not there now. Now put this hand over here on it. It's not there now. It's not there now. Now put this hand here on it. There it is. Now, you're just as much human in that hand as you are in this hand. Now, I'm just as much human as you would be human. 
It won't work here. It won't work there because God told me in the vision, so if the people know it's truth, take the person, let them see. When you put your right hand to me, you're pledging that you believe me. He said, if you get the people to believe you and then be sincere, nothing shall stand before the prayer. Did you ever read the book? How many has read that in the books? For years and years. Now, see, then I'll give you my left hand because you're just my sister. My right one goes to God. I believe his promise that he told me that. See, then you say, I do believe. Why? Because it wouldn't be the sensation on my hand so much as telling you what's wrong. Then you believe me, don't you? Then I'll raise my hand to God. I believe you, God. I'll put my hand over here. I, I believe you, Brother Branham. There it is. See, that makes it. Now, put your hand on here. Now, I want you to notice, young lady, that it isn't the way I hold my hand or any... Well, the thing of it is, how would I know what it was if, if it wasn't for that? But you see, there is a sensation on my hand there, don't you? A little white thing's running around over my hand. Now, just as soon as you move your hand, it leaves. And it won't come with this other hand. Now, I put it on here. There it is again. Now, look, lady, I want you to watch that real close. If that goes away, you're healed. But now, remember, I will not be able to keep it away. Because when the unclean spirit's gone out of a person, walks in dry places, returns back with seven other devils. Or if God can come here and show you something, visibly, and you know beyond a shadow of doubt that something takes place and there's somebody here that knows you. Is that right? In the spirit. Someone discerned a disease that you had. Now, if that leaves, are you going to believe it's going to stay away? All right. You women all bow your head just a minute. I want you to watch my hand. Now, first I'm going to pray. Just check your faith. And I'll show you. I won't use my, lose my hand. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray for this girl that you'll remove this affliction from her body. Your God... My arm lays here by the side of your Bible. You promised to heal the sick. That's your word. We believe you with all that's in our heart. Now, let the thing leave her, Father. I pray through Jesus' name. Now, before I raise my head, the thing has not left. Is that right, ladies? Say, say yes or no. It's still on there, isn't it? Yes, it's still moving. See? Just prayer alone won't do it. It's got to take faith. See what I mean now? Now watch. There it is again. Now, do you believe that the Bible said, In my name they shall cast out devils? Now, you have to watch what you're doing about that. You have to watch because, remember, Moses smote a rock when he wasn't supposed to. Elijah cursed 42 little children and bears killed him before they got back because they said he was bald-headed, teased him about it. It wasn't the will of God to do that. That don't sound like the Holy Spirit, an angered prophet. I want you to watch that, the girlie. You watch my hand. You be honest, see. Now, if that hand turns back like this, it's gone without me moving. Now, bow your head everywhere because you've got to make it go now. If you make it go, it's anger. And we know it'll go from one to another. Satan, an angel of God came 14 years ago to Green's Mill one night and told me as a local minister that I was sent to pray for the sick. And this is what was told. You're aware of that. You're exposed. You can have unbelief in the people. You can make people doubt. But you can't make Christ do anything because he has stripped you of every legal right you ever had. When he died at Calvary, he paid the debt of all of our sin and unbelief. God has given his servants power to cast you out. I use his name. I come in the name of Jesus Christ. I challenge you in this duel of faith. Leave the girl. Come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, before I raise my head... Open my eyes, the thing is gone. Is that right? Now open your eyes. Something happened, hasn't it? You even feel different, don't you? Now look here. There it is. Now wait, I'll take my hand off of you. Now put this hand on, just like you did a while ago. See how it looks? Now put this hand on, just like you did a while ago. See how it looks? Something happened, didn't it? You're healed. That's what it is. Praise God. Go on your own and choice and say anything. Now, let's see this man's hand just a minute. He has a little of prostrate, which makes him nervous to get up or something. But that's right. You get up at night time. But that's not really what you want because I feel your spirit moving something else. All right. You think you'd ever be crippled? You think that arthritis ever crippled you or anything? You believe God's going to make you well now? No, God's going to heal me. Amen. He has done it. Walk off the platform and rejoice and shout it. Saying praise the Lord. Let's see you, sir. Come here now. Let me have your hand. Yes, sir. Stomach trouble. You believe God will heal that? In the name of Jesus Christ, may the devil lead this boy. Go out of him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Go believe it. All right, come. For the baby? Now let's see its little hand. Just a minute. Well, the dear little boy. Hey, the old dear fellow. Yes, sir. No, it isn't. It's no infection. Just a minute. Now, do you believe if God can tell me what's wrong with the baby, that God will heal it? Will you accept Jesus as a healer of that baby? It's heart trouble. It's a bad heart. Doctors don't even know what to do about it. That's right. But God does know what to do about it. Satan, leave the child in the name of Jesus. I condemn the devil and ask for its healing. Amen. Take it now. Believe with all your heart, you'll get well. Come. How do you do, honey? You believe Jesus? Let's see his little hand. Now, yep. Think the kidney trouble leaving to get all right and be well? You believe with all your heart that Christ will heal it? Lord Jesus, I condemn the devil that's harmed this child. May it leave in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have faith. Believe now. Don't doubt. Go believing. And if you believe with all your heart, it'll take place. Now, let's see your hand. Asthmatic condition, but do you believe that God can heal that and make it well? We accept him as your healer? I condemn the devil that's harmed our sister in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave the woman. Go believe me. I don't doubt, but believe with all your heart. How many out there that doesn't have prayer cards will believe? How many of you will actually say, I believe? Have faith. Don't doubt. You believe that arthritis will leave you? The man sitting there looking at me right back here, the elderly like man, if you believe with all your heart, God will heal you. There sits a man right here with a rupture. Do you believe God will heal you, sir, sitting right there with a the rupture, praying? You was kind of bald-headed here in front with a string tie. Yes, sir. Stand up on your feet and accept your healing. Have you got a prayer card? No, sir. Your wife's got one. Well, if your wife's got one, you haven't got one, then you can go home with her and be healed if she's healing the line. Amen. If you'll believe with all your heart, I challenge you to believe it to be the truth. You believe it, every one of you? Then have faith in God. Something happened somewhere. It wasn't this person. You believe God will heal you? Lord, in the name of Jesus, heal the woman. Amen. I go believe with all your heart. If you can believe this and don't doubt it, it'll take place. Come, sister. Now, you know I know what's wrong. <laughs> but if I, if I don't tell you you believe anyhow, won't you? Yes, sir. But I just tell you your nervousness is gone from me. You can go home and be well. <laughs> so just don't doubt it. When you were sitting there, the heart trouble left, so just keep on walking. Now, if I don't say one thing to you, will you accept it and believe it's all right? All right, your back trouble's gone, so just go on home and be well. And have faith in God, believe with all, all of your heart. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll heal the woman in Jesus' name. Come now, believing with all your heart, in the name of Jesus, may our brother be healed. Now see, they're getting healed just the same. Amen. You believe it? Amen. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. Hallelujah. Have faith, don't doubt it. Amen. We see the poor brother's crippled up. You believe that God will heal you, sir? Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our brother be healed. Amen. Don't doubt. Don't believe him, huh? You'll get well. Come, sir. In the name of Jesus Christ, I'll lay my hands up on you, brother. And the Bible said these signs will follow them as please. Amen. Amen. Thank Jesus you, Jesus. Be you believe, sister? In the name of Jesus Christ, may they be healed. Amen. I'm not looking for visions because I'm getting so weak now. I'm uh, just feeling my legs trembling under me. In the name of Jesus Christ, may they be healed. You believe, brother? You going to believe? In the name of Jesus Christ, may they be healed. Amen. Come, little lady, you going to believe? In the name of Jesus Christ, may sister be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. Come, brother, you going to believe this now, are you? In the name of Jesus Christ, may our brother be healed. Come, sister. Of course, you know what you're doing. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sisters be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sisters be healed. Amen. In the name Hallelujah. of Jesus Christ, may our brother be healed. God bless you, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, may you be healed. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed. Come, brother. Believe now and believe. In the name of Jesus Christ, may my brother be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may my brother be healed. Come, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, may my brother be healed. Are you doubting? Are you, are, are you doubting with all your heart? Or are you believing with all your heart? 
You believe? Now, I never used the discernment. I knew what was wrong with the people. You're aware of that, don't you? That's right. Here, is this, I still got the patient in my hand. Look here, sir. I just said, God bless you. That's all I said. You go on through. Is that right? You believe you're healed anyhow? Amen. All right. You had cancer. That's right. That was on the pelvis bone. That's right. Your name's Mr. Peterson. That's right. Go home to See? See? That's it. Just believe it. Sitting right there with eczema. You believe God will heal you? Make you well? You have a prayer card? You don't. You believe that God will make you well anyhow? All right. Receive your healing. Jesus Christ make you well. Hallelujah. Amen. You believe with all your heart, each one of you? How many believes that God is in his universe? God is in his word. God is in his son. God is in his people. Now, how many feel that you've got God in your heart? Raise your hand. All right. Now, put your hands on one another and be praying for one another while I go down and pray for these people in the wheelchair. Brother Roy, lead them in prayer. While you put your hands on one another. Just put your hands on one another. Believe with all your heart. Lord Jesus, come now. You're here with the people. Amen. God's in his people. Yes, Lord. May they be healed, every one of them, Amen. while we're being in prayer. Hallelujah. Keep your hands on one another. Keep praying. Praise God is Lord. in his people. Amen. Leave Hallelujah. it while I pray for thee. Praise the Lord.